This is the Gatekeepers Podcast with Billy Grove. Billy is an innovative leader in the industry and loves teaching how to build quality fence. So sit down, grab a cold beverage, and get ready to talk about fence. Today's show is sponsored by Mr. Fence Academy. If you're looking to hit the next level in your fence company, check out Mr. Fence Academy. And now, live from the Mr. Fence Academy studios, here's your host, Billy Grove. Man, where did that come from? That was pretty cool. That was pretty cool, huh? What's going on, everybody? What's going on, Fence Fam? What's going on, Facebook? Uh, the Gatekeepers here. I am up. Oh, it's gonna play again. My bad. I this is the good. Gatekeepers podcast uh, with Billy Grove. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. There we go. My name is Billy Grove, and this is Billy Gentry. How you doing? All right. And uh, we are the Gatekeepers, and uh, tonight we have a very special guest, uh, Mr. David Gatto. Before we get to him, though, we're gonna do our normal. How was your week? Um, Dude, my week has actually been pretty pretty awesome. I can't lie at all. It's been good. Uh, weekend before last, I took my oldest son uh, hunting. He dropped his first doe, so that was awesome. Uh, I got to take it. Uh, I managed to take a six point, so it was a fun time. Got a lot of cool photos. Him and I got to share that. Uh, this past weekend, I took one of my twins to the arcade, and that little joker won one of those like 10,000 ticket things. And he could literally pick anything he wanted on the entire wall and still had 5,000 tickets left over. That's awesome, man. That's great. That was, that was a good weekend. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I, uh, we had a, we had a pretty chillax weekend. Um, Saturday didn't really do much. Um, and then Sunday was the Super Bowl, watched the Super Bowl and then, uh, went to bed and then went back to work and, uh, Today was my first fence wash in like a year and a half, man. Dude, yeah, that was uh, that was pretty cool. I'm way out of practice. I'm not even gonna lie. It will. Well, I realized that without my chemical sprayer, I was like four times as slow. Um, <laughs> with the pump sprayer, uh, I was like halfway through, and I was like, man, with my chemical card, I would have been done by now. But is what it is. Um, uh, so. Let me go ahead and drop our social media thing. Guys, if you would, do us a favor and go to gatekeepers.com. Oh, I'm on the wrong thing. There we go. Gate Gatekeeperpodcast.com. I think I just clicked it. No, I clicked the wrong thing. There we go. There that one is. right there. Gatekeeperpodcast.com. Uh, give us a like, a subscribe, uh, follow. Uh, there's also the merchandise store um, there. There's every way to watch, to listen, anything that you want to find us on. You can find us right there at gatekeeperpodcast.com. And without further ado, we are going to go ahead and bring our guest on, Mr. David Gatto. Yo, what's up, guys? How we doing, Mr. David? How we doing tonight? Oh, man, I can't complain. Mr. Awesome. David, my friend, awesome. how are you doing, sir? It's been a couple uh weeks. Oh yeah, man. Um, uh, it's good. It's good to be on here. It's good to see you guys. Um, uh, I like the format. I like the show. It's it's very professional, and your room looks exactly like mine somehow. Um, I know, right? Identical, I know, except right. for the Mister Fence thing in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was gonna actually go with uh, uh, with green tiles, but then after I talked to Sean and um, we got sponsored, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna go with the blue. And I had yeah. already seen um, like some of your stuff, so I was like, "I'm gonna be looking just like a, um, like just like Mr. Gatto in the background." Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome, yeah, right, man. right. And right. like what we always, awesome. even in the fence world, tr trying to trying to be like Mr. Gatto, even now in the podcast world, trying to be like. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no, How was yet. your week, Mr. Gatto? I know you've been busy. Um, Stay. it's been good. It's been good. Um, I think I got a little bit sick yesterday. Um. I was out riding my four wheeler at night after I got out of the shower in a t-shirt and sandals on and, you know, buzzing through a field at 40 miles an hour. And I'll tell you what, I woke up in the morning and I felt like I got hit by a truck. Right. So I'm recuperating from that now. But um, other than that, I mean, the, the week's great. I mean, business is good. Business is booming right now. Um, you know, we're getting into the salmon season. It's about to happen in, in March. That's when the big rush initially happens and uh you know we're we're geared up for that and 
you know, I mean, it feels like it already started, but um, we're off to a we're off to a really good start, man. I mean, uh, better than I deserve. I'll put it to you like that. Awesome. That's awesome to hear, man. That's awesome to hear. Salmon season. That sounds like a good time. Yeah, right. Oh yeah, that's the salmon rush, boy. The March comes around, and and the the phones are going to be ringing off the hook. Oh, okay. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Got gotcha. you. All right, I'm well, I'm picking up on it now, dude. That went yeah. over the of our head. Yeah, yeah, more yeah. Right <laughs> yeah dude, I thought you were talking about like legit fishing for a minute. Yeah. I was like, oh, oh yeah. man, yeah. man yeah. it's coming. I, it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens when you talk to a bunch of guys from Florida where it's fishing year round. It's like, yeah. oh, what up there? Yeah, salmon yeah. season. We don't have salmon here. So I was like, okay, I'm right. Yeah, the rush is coming. I mean, historically, everything picks up in March, right? The numbers get the numbers get tripled. And, you know, once you start um, looking at your YOYs, your year over year, you know, you start to um, pick up on these things. And that right there, you just heard why Mr. Gatto is Mr. David Gatto. Just boom, right there in the YOY. Right. right, yeah. right. <laughs> it's like, but some people have never heard of is second nature language. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, shoot. I mean, we're just going to jump right into it. I'm going to take the first one. Um, all right, David. So you've told your story on a couple different podcasts, so I'm not going to uh, go down that. Okay. that Good. Cool that whole route again i've heard it it's a phenomenal story Absolutely. every time i listen to it it's like the first time i've heard it but i'm sure the majority of our listeners uh like i've heard it so yeah. that, that being said being in business we all make mistakes right what's one of the mistakes that you have made that you turned around to a monumental success after you corrected the wrong you know and uh that's a, that's a hard question because, you know, we learn from our mistakes and, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes, whether they be hiring mistakes, uh, tax mistakes, operational mistakes, um, you know, it took big monetary losses. The ones that cost you a lot of time and money, those are the ones that, um, uh, that you really learn those lessons. Right. And, and believe it or not, probably, probably my, my biggest one came this year, well, in 2023, right. Where, <clears throat> you know, we were, we were heavy in the uh, uh, supply game, you know, supplying a lot of different companies. You know, we had some advertising going on on Google AdWords and, you know, we were attracting traffic in. And but what we did attract was uh, credit card fraud. Right. And, Ooh. you know, so somebody put in, you know, we were using QuickBooks as a processor at the time, uh, which we dropped them. Um, but what happened was, is these guys had you know, thousands of skimmed credit card numbers. You know, they put the credit card in the machine, it gets skimmed, right? So these guys were calling up my sales guys, putting in phone sales, you know, and my salesman, you know, they wanted to, to push the sales through. I mean, it sounded good. You know, these were big orders, you know, and so they were pushing them through. So they sold uh, 13 orders, right? So anyways, we the money goes through, it's deposited in our account. It sits for about a week, everything's good. And, um, you know, they start coming and picking up these orders. And there's various different vehicles coming. I mean, there's box trucks, there's towing companies coming, concrete companies uh, hauling. These are all like independent yeah. contractors, right? So they pick all this stuff up. Well, the next month turns in that cycle and uh, we started getting chargebacks, right? And so we got 13 chargebacks totaling over $50,000, you know, because oh. people started getting their credit card statements back. They're like, wait a second. Right. I'm in Florida and, and this, I didn't order a fence from Pennsylvania. Right. right? So right. it was a complete loss, right? Uh, we, we had everything on camera, but the people who picked the stuff up, they were, um, uh, they were paid with fraudulent credit cards as well. Um, and they just dropped the stuff off in different locations, New York, New Jersey. Um, they were in Maryland, Virginia. Um, you know, so we tracked them down and it turns out there's an exclusion on our insurance policy that says that if we willingly give material up, um, being if there was deception or trickery used, we're excluded, right? So the insurance company wouldn't do nothing. And we had a, you know, a max wholesale endorsement, the top of the line possible business insurance that you can have, right? And it still was um, excluded, right? So <clears throat> we worked at the police department and the police department, you know, they came down to the report, the detectives were there and they told us straight up, they said, listen, Unless this is a homicide, New York, New Jersey, Virginia, these guys aren't going to work with us. So we're just writing this up so that you can get an insurance claim, which the insurance claim got thrown out. And then so, you know, we tried the FBI. The FBI said it needs to be 100000 for us to get involved. So we 
learned a really big lesson there, right? Not to get caught up in the emotion, not to get caught up in the sale, but follow the process, scrutinize, have them fill out a vendor packet, have them uh, you know, include their social security number, their EIN number, their business address, a copy of their ID, right? Before they can do a phone sale. Um, and, and, you know, so we learned a really important lesson for that. And, and we really turned it around, right? I mean, our staff got stronger. Um, we tightened up our operations and, you know, I can remember that, you know, we were in the dumps, right? Because we had bought in, you know, we paid a hundred thousand dollars cash for a, a Moffat truck and bought some more sales vehicles and another van. And, you know, um, so our capital, our cash flow was down and we decided to you know, give, right? We said, you know what? It's easy to give when we have abundance, but let's give when we don't have nothing, right? And let's see how that comes around. So we had a very successful um, Toys for Tots drive. Uh, and it just that. turned I out saw to, that. I saw yeah, that. And it's, it's going to be huge this year, right? So we turned a negative into a positive and we tightened up our team, but that was probably the biggest single loss um, that we had taken in business. And so, you know, it goes like this, right? You, you pay for your education one way or the other, whether if it's in college or whether um, it's, it comes in the form of a fifty thousand dollar loss, right? Ooh, <laughs> right, I like that, guys. Uh, right, right. And I guess they both cost about the same amount of money. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, so is what it is on that one. Man, that's that is that that's right there. There's something else to start thinking about. Yeah, get back in mind. Yeah, I'm gonna start going to get in that road in distribution, and you know, where you start going to resale. There it is. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, uh, predators out there for sure. That's a scary thing right there. All right. So I'll change this up a little, Mr. Davis. So you and I have talked uh, quite extensively in the past, you know, absolutely for about a year and a half now, off and on, I've hit you up for various things. And of course, on the personal side, I've always appreciated that, especially when I broke my leg a couple months ago, you were definitely somebody to kind of lean on and add questions on how to fix stuff and how to make things happen. So on a personal note, absolutely appreciate you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. And this question kind of goes into what you were helping me with there for a while. Um, knowing that you run a subcontract model, you don't have any in-house crews. Um, was there ever a point where you did have in-house crews and what was that deciding? And if you did, what was that deciding factor where you wanted to switch and you became an all subcontract model? Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Good question. Um, so at the time we had, uh, we had four crews running out there, you know, with crew leads and stuff like that. Um, you know, we had that, the Bobcats, the MTs, the trailers, the, you know, the one ton trucks, all that stuff going out there. and you know, we started to really hone in our marketing and our sales process, right? So the leads really started coming in and, you know, and we ramped things up in sales and we started selling a lot of fence, right? And I mean, just an astronomical amount and our crews couldn't keep up with this, right? And so, you know, we started to get so pushed back on the schedule. So this was out of necessity, this happened in the beginning. We started to get, you know, 12, 16, 18 weeks out and the estimates were becoming irrelevant, right? Because people didn't care about our reputation. They didn't care about the price. Right. Some people did, but the majority, no, they want what they want and they want it now, right? So we started to get really pushed back. And, you know, we said, hey, we got to hire subcontractors, right? So <clears throat> we started vetting and we started hiring subcontractors to do the work. And the production floor really got ramped up. So now the production guys can't keep up with all the production, you know, with the CNC machines in there, the cut tables, they're bundle mm -hmm. abandoned orders, keeping inventory away and stuff, taking pictures, all this stuff's happening in there. And so what we did is we pulled all of our in-house crews in, right, and put them in the production floor, turned another one into a salesman, an outside sales rep, and then another inside sales rep, right? So we brought all of our crew in. Now, some people didn't like that, right? And some people left. So, you know, that's what happens, right? Some people don't like change. And so our, all of our in-house crews came in-house to work on the production floor, right? <clears throat> and so we're hiring the subcontractors. They're out there doing the work. We're ramping up the production. And along the way, um, we ran into a lot of problems with subcontractors that we had to iron out. You know, a lot of costly things had happened, right? And a, a lot of, you know... Um, different things that you can imagine uh, going wrong with people cutting post off, you know, fences were blowing over all types of different things uh, that we had dealt with, but it was at a necessity that <clears throat> we had the subcontracting crews brought in because it is so much easier to scale, right? By hiring companies 
who already have crews. They're vetted. They're trained. They got trucks. They got MTs. They got their own insurance. So our liability insurance went way down. Our workers' comp went way down. Um, right. You know, because there's less exposure. Our guys are in the warehouse. They're not leaving. Um, and so we really started to dial it in and see the benefits of what was happening. Um, we were able to control our prices a lot more as well. You know, um, <clears throat> our profits, we no longer had to do a p and We know exactly what we're going to make, right? So we were able to scale much, much quicker. And we just had to get really good at vetting these crews, right? At being able to judge, you know, is this a good company? Is this a good contract? Are these guys on drugs? What kind of truck do they got out there? What kind of machinery do they got? Um, what kind of reputation do they got? And, um, <clears throat> you know, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that we could talk about that goes along with that. But that is our model. So we have, you know, 14 different sub crews that run out there. And okay. we have one warranty rework team, right? So the warranty rework team has a van. It's completely fitted <clears throat> out. They can do anything to a fence. And it's just basically support for our subcontractors, you know, so if there's some caps that blew off, you know, the van will go out there, it'll fix it. If there's a gate that needs adjusted, if there's a post at a plumb, if, you know, if something was left there, it needs to be cleaned up, you know, so there's support mm -hmm. for um, the subcontracting crew, subcontracting crews. And then um, we have a project manager um, that goes out, they get eyeballs in the job. They get a list of all the active installations happening they go out there, they meet with the customers, they meet with the contractors, they just give an overview, make sure everything's running smooth and, um, you know, just so <clears throat> that things are being installed to our standard, right? Outstanding. Outstanding. That's awesome. That's, I can only imagine the amount of trial and error, putting yeah. all of those pieces that puzzle together to make it, to make it work. All the different, you know what I mean? Just. That's uh, that's a that's a that's impressive, Mr. David. That's oh yeah, there's a lot of um, trial and error, um, and there's a lot of you know legalities too that you got to be careful of, right? Because you know you got to have subcontractor agreements in place because if you don't, workers' compensation they're going to audit you and they're going to say, hey, where's your subcontractor agreement for these subs? These guys are employees. You're treating them mm -hmm. in the capacity of an employee, so therefore we technically insured them while they were out there, right? And so they want to circle back around. Mm -hmm which I was sued twice by um, the workers' compensation department. Um, and that's so I learned how to really structure a subcontractor agreement, you know, and, you know, you got to get a packet to hire these guys. You got to get a, a W-9, you know, get their EIN, uh, get all this stuff on file, copy of their driver's license. You know, you want your, you know, your certificate of insurance, their COI, and you want to be added as an additional on it. So there's rules mm -hmm. to the game. And as long as you follow the rules, you're good. It, it absolutely. Um... <clears throat> You know, whenever uh, I had my injury, and you know, we're talking about going into the subcontract model, it uh, it's amazing how much more it is in depth, and you're still chasing, you're still, it's still, I say chasing, you still have, you still have the issues like you were talking about. You have the in-house crew that is just a repair truck. Like how, what happens whenever a subcontractor does not quite meet up to the end of the bargain that requires a callback. What happens to that? Is there a penalty involved? Is like hey, once or twice, like hey, accidents happen, or is it um, you know, is there you know penalties? What do you what do you guys do for that? Yeah, you know, um, and there's stuff yeah. outlined in our subcontractor agreement about that. Um, but here's the reality, right? Sometimes a subcontractor go out there and make a very costly mistake, right? And they're not a big company like you, so they can't afford to go out and fix it. So what they do is they run, right? Um, and they, they, you know, the phone goes off. They don't talk to you no more. And, you know, you're out, you know, 15,000 bucks, $20,000, and the whole job got to be ripped out and has to be redone. So, you know, there's a couple things you could do. It's only ever worked out for us once. Um, one thing you want to review on your certificate of insurance with these subs, you want to make sure that they do not have an exclusion for faulty workmanship, right? Because we were able to recoup the material money because they had a faulty workmanship um, endorsement on their insurance. But other than that, um, other than taking these guys to court and suing them when something happens, which is pretty much fruitless, um, yeah. being that most of them are broke, uh, you know, we just stop using them, right? And we'll chalk it up. And so 
we try to mitigate this with the superintendent, right? They go out there, they check on the job, they make sure the post, you know, because we had issues where, you know, subs cut the post off. We had three fences blow over. You know, these guys, you know, gave us a message. Hey, we're going out of business, by the way. I took a job at UPS. Um, you know, we, we went after his insurance company. We got paid for that. But, um, <laughs> yeah, Man. so uh, yeah. there's really not much you can do That's except right. saying, hey, you suck. You're not working for us no more. Um, go get a job somewhere else. Uh, you know, and that's what it comes down to sometimes. Nice. Right nice. On. I mean, you got to do what you got to do, right? You got to. That is the uh, policy and procedures, man. Policy and procedures. Oh, I'm actually sleeping. Um, so I think I have my question a little uh, background or like a little backwards because I caught it whenever you were explaining um but basically when did you when did you start not just getting into refill refill, refill yeah. retail but uh cnc or manufacturing of your products and vinyl yeah, yeah vinyls and aluminums and tell me a little bit about that process because i've heard some stories of you in there with like a hand router and now i see you oh, guys man. are like multiple he, cnc he had, machines he didn't he just have a jig that was made out like two by fours that yeah we had a jig right that was we still have it in there um it's cut table now um awesome. but like you know it, it was another thing out of necessity right because our warehouse had five companies in it um actually six and we we uh, effectively all six companies are gone now and we have the whole place right so we originally got a part it was a tire shop right and so I got this tire shop and I'm like, this shop has got to pay for itself. I said, this is expensive. I said, what can we do here? Right. And then I got the idea. I said, well, we could probably, I started looking at these other fence companies and I'm like, where are they getting this shit from? You know what I mean? I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, cause we're buying job lots and stuff. I didn't really understand the game. And then I said, they must be getting this stuff from somewhere else. Right. And then so I, you know, I made a bunch of phone calls. I found out all the politics that are involved and, in, you know, going to distributors directly and, you know, I'm going to, you know, people that have exclusivity terms. Right. And so anyways. I buy lineals, right, because I do the math. Right. And I say, you know what? I could save an astronomical amount of money on our fence if we're even involved in just cutting the stuff and routing these posts. I said, how hard could it be? to route these posts. Right. And mm -hmm. so we started doing the math on everything. And that was our first thing. You know, we built tables in there, a very big carpeted table for, to, you know, build gates on and um, a very long table that we cut holes in it. And we had these blocks that would come down and we would take a hand router and go in there and cut these things. It was terribly painful. Um, <laughs> You know, and then we got a um, table CNC, which really wasn't for the fence industry. And we had to learn geometric code and, you know, X, Y, Z access and write these very long programs using Word that would cut all these profiles for us. Um, so we started getting heavy into it. And then we got an SSD machine and then we just started, you know, getting more parts of the warehouse. Then we got a 10,000 square foot spot, which was a power washing um, company beforehand. Then we got a tractor trailer inspection station. Uh, we turned that into a showroom. And then, you know, um, we just found out ways to utilize this. Then we said, wait a second, we're making all this fence for ourselves. Why can't we sell it to other fence companies like they used to sell to us? You know, we're right. buying, you know, 53 foot tractor trailer loads and we're getting good price. Let's start a program where we reach out and cold call these other fence companies and go meet them. Right. Go bring them coffee. Just right. do the things that were done to us. Right. Right. And do it to them now. Um, and it worked out really well, you know. Um, and so, you know, um, honestly, if we were to be buying job lots from a company, they wouldn't be able to keep up with us, you know. Um, and so it's at a necessity that we have to do uh, all these orders um, in house. Right. And and it created it opened up a, a lot of opportunities and, you know, got me into the part that I really love. I love the manu manufacturing aspect. I love lean production um, and implementing all this stuff. Um, it's just so fun. Um, and it, it, it changed us. It changed uh, right. who we are and um, how we think and changed us as people, you know? Right, right. I, I think that's, that is just really cool, man. That is, that's definitely where 
I, I think I think more so is getting you know away from the installation side of things and into distribution and into you know more of like the showroom stuff like you're talking about. That definitely definitely seems seems more appealing, more appetizing. That seems like a like all right, cool. I've done the install game for five, six years now. Like, cool. Like, what's you know, it's always like, what's next? Like, what's around the corner? That's something that's always been very appealing to me. Well, yeah, that's what you're talking about right there is why Absolutely. it's kind of the mindset. It's why am I in competition with all these other people whenever I can make all these other people my customers? Right. Oh yeah, yeah. And you know what? Um, it comes down to this, right? You got to think in these terms, right? At some point, you got to stop thinking like an employee, and you got to start thinking like a CEO. Right. And you've got to tell yourself the cold, hard facts, right? That whenever you're out in the field personally installing or making a sale, you are going backwards. Now, I understand we got to start there, right? But you got to stay mm -hmm. in that mind frame and you got to pull yourself out of that because I put it to you like this, right? It's like a boat, right? Like a ship, right? And the captain of the ship, something goes wrong with the motor down there. The captain does not leave. And go down there and start tinkering with the motor, right? Because the ship will just start floating around all over the place, right? He's got to direct the <laughs> ship. He's got people that go down there and work on that motor. So you're the captain of the ship, man. So you got to keep yourself out of the field, work on your business and not in your business. You got to think like a CEO, you know, and delegate things, automate things, eliminate things, right? Because, you know, I got, can you imagine if I was out in the field, uh, you know, and I got 14 crews. Yeah out there installing not all at once all the time but you know there's a lot of stuff going on there's salesmen at doors there's you know there's um outside sales visiting other businesses i could never do that right so right. i would have never grew right i would have i would have made i would have did a million right uh, uh, i know what i could do out there running crews in the field right and it's it's not a lot it's not right right and that's what that's what we're trying to trying to graphs and slowly slowly get crawl into. and just scratch to get to right now it's just like every time we're like all right yeah we don't have to build a fence and boom building a fence Damn it. well well hey we've done good we've done good there's been multiple weeks where we have not touched a touched a single tool that is very that's good we, we can't lie it's we can't lie and we're 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 still in the baby beginning stages of it 100 and so like yeah, there might be a time where we have to build one or two fences a week, and I'm all right with that. But mm -hmm. no more of this four and five a week for us. Oh like that's out the that's out the window. So you know, we're uh, honestly, if it's not a driven job, we're um we're oh, still yeah. stepping it out. Oh, if, yeah. it's, if it's not like a, an in and out, you know, like an I beam or a post mash or something, we can that Billy can knock out in a day. You know what I mean with the helper? Then it's then we're just. It's, we'll sell we'll out all the concrete jobs where we're as kind of dipping our toes in that subcontract model yeah. and uh, wanting wanting to teach other crews around here as well how to do like the driven post where we can teach them to elevate and hopefully try to just not just that but the more of these guys around town that are doing this the easier it's going to be to sell because oh yeah it's not going to be just three or four of us because I know there's now probably four of us who are driving post around yeah, town. Yeah, about four in town. Uh, four, four, yeah. maybe five, but four for sure. You and like a dominating position too, you know, differentiates yeah, you. Yeah, and well, yeah, I know, but not just that, but like the more people that are talking about it at quotes and estimates, the easier it is going to be for us to sell. And it's not a hard product to sell at the end of the day, uh -huh. but like. I had one sub reach out uh, last night for some vinyl product he just wanted to buy. And uh, he was like, I'm thinking about driving this. And I was like, look, you pay me X amount of dollars. I'll come train you and your crew to drive this job and then yeah. start like and then just like start selling them, start selling them. That mm -hmm. way the word gets spread throughout the entire city. And uh, that's that's kind of where I'm at it, like with it right now. Again, yeah, if we can just start selling these people uh, vinyl and start making that making that part of the subcontract and distribution game kind of start tying itself together, where we can not only do for you know, ourselves but for others, and it, it's, I think it's yeah. Like, yeah well, I, I mean, know, what do you think? I know you and I've talked about it, you know, plentiful in the past, but you know, anyway. Sorry, I'm still getting used to the podcast stuff, man. Oh, you're good, brother. Whole, you're good, my, bro. My second, third time doing it. Yeah. Third time, man. Third time's yeah. a charm, right? 
But uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Anyway, moving on a little bit, and all this goes in the, in the hand, uh, preaching policy, process, and procedures. This is a question that I, I, I was really interested in. If you had to do it all over again, and I'm not, this, you know, just if you had to do it all over again, knowing what you know now, what would be probably one of the very first things that you would implement to make your, to, to make, to get this thing going? If you had to start all over from square one, what is, what is Mr. David Gatto going to do to set himself up for success? Got a lot of people look at you as a mentor, as a motivator, somebody who is big in the industry and who is, you know, not just, you know, in the fence world, but also in your personal world. What is going to be your first step to make your life easier? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, um, knowing it, it took me, it took me five years to hit a million, right? And it took, it took me five years to figure this out. And, um, you know, I know the game now, right? So, so I could go out of business today, right? And I could start yes, up in another industry and probably any industry. I'm not trying to sound cocky, but, you know, I'll make a million my first year, right? Because I, I know marketing, I know sales, you know, I know how to... Uh, systems of processes. I know how to streamline stuff. I know how to work from the neck up, right? And not the neck down. Um, you get paid more for working from the neck up, by the way. And so like, yeah. you know, there's some of the things like that, the thing that uh, absolutely, um, uh, yeah. it's a hundred percent true. And, you know, um, the first thing that I would do is I would take myself out of the field. Um, it wasn't until I did that, that I truly started to grow. Right. I would get myself out of there. And like I said, I would work from the neck up. Right. I would call other fencing companies or other subcontractors who are subbing for other fence companies, find out how much they were making and pay them more. Right. And then they would come over to me and I would sell these jobs and I would factor in, hey, here's my pricing for a panel, a post concrete. Here's what I'm paying my um uh, my subcontractors, and here's what I need to make, right? So I would structure mm -hmm. my um, sales out to pay for those subcontractors and get the profits that I needed to get, right? And then I, I would do that first, right? Because the selling part is easy. So once I go sell the job, I'd sub it out, right? And then naturally, I would just keep building on that. You know, I would get a salesman to take my place and I would start working in the office again. And then I would get somebody in the office to take my place and, and so on and so forth, right? And it's a, it's a, it's a game of delegating, right? And, and knowing when to hire somebody and saying, hey, it comes down to this, like, can I support this person in a career, right? And you got to know your numbers, right? You got to know like, hey, each employee should be producing around $500,000 a year, right? So if you're making a million dollars a year and you got two employees, you're doing good right there. Once you fall below that number, you're doing bad, right? So, I mean, the first thing I do just to sum it up, man, I get out of the field, right? Um, ASAP, right? Because it's not hard to get the subs. All you got to do is find out what the other companies are paying them, pay them more and they'll leave. Right. Period. And then you treat them better. Right. If, 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 if you stiff them on a couple of things on accident, you send your, your van out there to bring them. Don't worry about it. Don't come back to the shop. I got you. Right. And just offer them amenities that these other companies weren't offering in addition to the pay and you'll keep them. Right. So it's not hard to get. So, you know, taking yourself out of the field, is a mental mindset thing. And a lot of people don't do it because they allow fear to stop them, right? And once the fear gets into their head, that transforms their whole world around them, right? They don't want to take the risks that it takes to get to the, you know, to break through those limitations of character and those fears that you had before. You got to take the plunge. And a lot of people, they're just not going to do it, right? And you're going to wonder why you're eight years in and you're still only doing a million or two million, right? And you're not hitting eight figures, right? And you're going to wonder why, because, you know, you got to let go of the fear. That's awesome. I, I feel like I got to sit through one of your, uh, your, spe your speeches. What are your presentations? Yeah. That was, yeah. that was, that was, that was. So it, I'm going truth, to segue right into your consulting company of the let grow, let, let go to grow, let go, let go to grow. To grow. Mm -hmm. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Cause I've been watching, I've been watching your journey and you doing public speaking outside of the fence world. And honestly, I very, I am extremely proud of you even though i don't even like really know you but like 
I love the fact that you're you're going and giving others light, even though it's not in the fence industry. And that's something that I like as well. So tell us just a little bit about that. Yeah. So the name, let go to grow. What does that mean? Right. That means that when I pick that name, let go to grow, right. That is specifically in telling people and coaching people on how to step into that CEO role and out of the field. Right. Because there's a whole lot of over information on there, how to be a, you know, programs on how to be a better installer. Like, I don't care about that. Right. I'm not an installer no more. Right. So I want to focus on putting people in a position to where their business is automated. Right. And it runs without their presence like mine does. Right. So that's the transition that I help people make. Right. And that's where I got the name Let Go to Grow. And in specific, who I look for. And this is stuff that I became very, very good at. I look for manufacturing concerns. I look for people who are into fabricating, who are into manufacturing things, right? Because I have honed in my processes so good with inventory control, control, just-in-time inventory, spaghetti diagrams, right? Systems and processes, standard operating procedures. I can come into a warehouse and I can look around and say, okay, there's $750,000 worth of loss a year, right? Look at all that inventory this guy's keeping. His inventory, it's turning once a year. Why does he have $3 million worth of inventory here, right? Boom, there goes a percentage right there. Or why is his CNC machine all the way over here and he's grabbing material all the way from over here? These guys are literally traveling football fields for no reason. You know, right. and being no, able to come in and see I those things and and shadow boards and being able to rearrange a warehouse. That's the stuff that I'm good at. So I look specifically for manufacturing concerns. Um, that's who I work with. Right. And that's who I'm good at. And I mean, I, I could take a look at somebody's P&L and I can, you know, from the p and I can I can see all kinds of major money leaks in there. You know, once I come and visit, I mean, it's a wrap, right? Because my vision is colored like that into lean manufacturing, you know, Six Sig Sigma, um, you know, uh, the Toyota way, uh, stuff like lean principles, lean management. Uh, I'm into that stuff, right? Because here's why. When you're doing multiple millions, right? If you're doing just a little bit, it's like being on a sailboat, right? There's not a whole lot of wind blowing. So you turn the sail nothing really happens, right? I mean, it starts to meander, it starts to go the way. But when you're doing multiple millions, it's like the wind picks up. So one little slight adjustment of the sail and the ship goes, boom, right? Because when you start adding percents, 2%, 3% saving on a 10 million or $20 million operation, you're literally putting paper millions back in your pocket and back in your company, right? right. So it's right. those little things. Uh, so that's, that's sort of like what I specialize in. And and I enjoy um, enjoy helping people in that. And I enjoy helping them, you know, delegate, automate, eliminate their procedures and step back. Because uh, like I said, it's a mental thing. It really is. Um, right. It's a fear thing that people don't do it. Right. And I don't know about you, but I'm not trying to own a high paying job. Right. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to, you know, be at all my daughters, all my kids events, watch them grow up, go to their games, know my wife, take my wife out on dates. Right. I'm not trying to be out there with a flashlight, you know, uh, digging a hole. Right. And we're, that's not why we got into this. Right. Days are, are done. Those days are up. Not. Oh, yeah. Know, the job is still due tomorrow. It's not why we, oh, yeah, not why we got in it. Right. But, you know, people no, get caught up in the. They get caught up in it, you know. They think, oh, well, I'm saving all this money. No, you're not. You're not saving money by doing the work out there. You are costing your company is what you're really doing. That's the facts, right? Right. That's the facts. Right. I mean, whew. man, that's some good stuff. That's some good stuff. So where's your uh, where's your next uh, like speaking event? Oh, um, I know I got four of them. Uh, believe it or not, the next one... This one's a little bit odd. Um, I'm actually going to speak at a church. Um, okay. So um, I agreed to it, although I got to talk to the pastor and make sure that what I'm going to say is appropriate. <laughs> Which I don't have a problem, you know, because God's part of my story. Sure. But um, uh, yeah, it's going to be at a church. Um, and that's coming up uh, shortly. 
So I did four already. I got four more booked. That's so you got four under your belt already, man. You've been doing yeah. this what now for what three months now? Three, two, three months, dude. I mean, I did it last year for the first time. Um, at that summit, been, right? Um, yeah, it might have been in September or October. Um, okay. and ever since then, I've had non stop uh events planned. And who knows? I mean, speaking of the Mr. Fence Academy, I might show up down at that retreat and talk. Okay, that, that, that's what's up. Heck yeah, you man. Know, um, I'll come down there and light that stage up. There we go. I, there we go. Light it on you, fire, you, baby. You go. I will absolutely be down. That'd be a fun time. Yeah. Come yeah. Yeah. I did. Soon. I did speak to Sean about it, although, you know, I haven't firmed nothing up yet with him. Um, but it's sure, something, man. you know, I would love to come down to that retreat and just uh, murder that stage, right? And uh, I think that I could change a lot of mindsets in there, right? Because um, that's what it's really about. It's about changing your mindset. I can't stress that en enough, right? Because, you know, the real changes, when, when you change the way that you think for real, your whole that's world that. begins to transform around you, right? It starts Absolutely. right here. The changes happen on the inside and manifest on the outside. Right? Absolutely. It does, that's not the other way around, right? It doesn't work like that. Private victories come before public victories. That's always a fact. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you, and, it's, and that's the thing is that so many people are so reserved or – it's, you just you I love it because you don't know or you don't know what you don't know until you know it. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. the thing. And, and you have to be willing to hear it, to understand it, to uh, to implement it. You have to be willing to say, Wow, I I I I've sucked at this now. Okay, well, now that you know you've sucked at it, now it's time to start getting better at it. Now it's time to start doing it. And if you don't at that point, you have no one else to blame but yourself. Having that knowledge of what you're doing wrong, not fixing it, well, that's just your own fault. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And, you know, um, guys, it's not rocket science. I mean, you know, there's people out here that are at or have been to where you're trying to go already. Right. There's like literally like step by step guides on how to get there. Although people Absolutely. won't do it, you know. Right. Um, so it's out there. I mean, the people are out there. The, the stuff's out there. The material's out there. So, you know, I mean, um, all you got to do is repeat it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, all the all the greatest all the uh, all the knowledge in the world is in books, man. I got to do is it, and what's great is even now you don't have to take the time to open a book. Like I do audio a lot books. of books on tape, like books on tape somewhere. It's, it's audio books. <laughs> you know, you find yourself driving, and so what I did was like, all right, well, I am I'm not gonna jam out. I'm not gonna listen to the radio. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to start listening to audio books because I was like realizing you know, that's. How, large part of my day is driving around checking on things going places doing this doing that and what the hell if i can multitask i can be driving and listening and it i've i'm on book number three for the year i think um i want to say i'm number three for the year yeah, yeah. but like yeah. then the guy who has a building next door i talk to him all the time he said, yeah <laughs> i'm on number 10 i'm like huh <laughs> he started huh. on the 10th book for the year yeah like, a lot of books <laughs> that's a lot of books man i'm but telling you what. but he's but he's it's funny he is the in the flooring world he's kind of like you he's got a uh three four locations now yeah uh, he just put the one right next door i've known the man for about 10 years and uh he's he's just like you it's so funny he's just started getting into speaking engagements he's 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 the view of the flooring world yeah yeah man he's a good yeah. guy too and he knows his stuff as well yeah oh, well, think about it the flooring world is the same thing that they're doing the same thing we're doing right yeah, but they're selling floor you know yep. you go to these big companies up here it's like corporate tile mart right you go in there um you know um somebody uh, uh a contractor comes in there to to buy the material they upsell the material they sell the job they subcontract the job out to subs who who um uh, put the put the floors in for them it's the same model they're they're it's wholesaling, exactly. they're retailing, and they got subcontractors mm -hmm. out there putting in floors. Yep. yep. And he has he has one he has yeah. one or two in-house crews that do all of his stuff. And yeah. uh he's where he runs it through different businesses. It's two totally different LLC uh, uh companies that has it. And uh he has one company that sells, one company that installs, and he sells the in other inst that's, that's exactly what you said. That's what he does, and he has a couple Same of business locations. model we're doing, and yeah, I've got man. him. On the other side of this wall right here, I uh, like I've yeah, man absolutely. For... He is right on the other side of this wall. Yep, I yep. forgot we're on the business uh, is business is business, man. It's all the same. Business is business it's, is business. It's so funny because I've talked to you in the past, and you've talked about how having like your daily affirmations and different things that you do uh, on a daily basis, just uh, just 
ultimately not just for yourself, but just good karma. Just, you know, just clearing the air and no stuff. It's so funny. Mr. J Pat next door, he does a lot. It's so funny how the simulators between you two. And that's where I was like, man, all right, these, there's two different people, two different worlds, two different business, uh, two, you know, two different businesses. And they're all preaching the same thing. I need to start listing these people. What, you know, what books are you reading? What are you learning? What is, you know, what, what do you know that I don't know that I need to know? Right. And until you, and, until you start putting yourself into those circles and so you start putting yourself you know into that that limelight of that stuff you you won't know it you know it's just right. like with yeah. podcasting billy didn't really know what was going on pasta you know in the beginning you know watched learned and now look where he's at you know six months later yeah yeah, yeah. you know faith yeah. without works is dead so you know knowing it's one thing but doing it's another right yeah. and so you gotta you gotta put the action in absolutely absolutely man and i remember i remember um even before i even told my wife that i even wanted to do the to do the podcast i knew about it and i was like uh i started going live a lot a lot more facebook lives you really did that was a lot yeah i was i was i was getting my feet wet into having people watch me live and I was making sure that Dude. I was going over five and six minutes. That way I would get people on there. And then after I was like, okay, cool, I can do this. I don't care if somebody has something negative to say, I'm just going to keep doing what I do. And, um, you know, that's when I told my wife after that is, you know, like after I did a couple months of those live videos, three and four times a week. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was just a, it was just a progression thing. And it just, my, my confidence built and built and built and built and built. And it was just a snowball effect. Right. Well, Mr. David, you've got, I know you're in your podcast booth now. How many episodes are you in on your, on your podcast, sir? Oh, I have no idea. Um, I actually, um, I actually laid off that part a little bit just because we built out that big studio at our warehouse, uh -huh. you know, and, and we're getting ready to launch that. I'm telling you, I got 50 K wrapped up in that studio already. I mean, between cinema cameras, we have a, a black magic wow. cinema camera, all kinds some of those lenses were like you know two thousand plus dollars um you know I then we got it. three yeah three we got three 4k cameras to get all the angles um you know we had that room remodeled new floors put in painted um uh, we got acoustical stuff in and bass traps and um lighting uh uh we got a table uh, had the whole uh, podcast um table built in the front so we could stand there and stools and computers you have like a and newscaster table don't you a what you have like a newscaster like table set up something that you would see on like the news or something right yeah i mean it's pretty serious um yeah, it, yeah. i thought yeah. the hard part was going to be building the studio that wasn't and i said okay the hard part's going to be getting all this equipment in here running all these wires you know we ran over 800 foot of cords and then i said okay wow. that's not it either Right, but getting all this stuff to to jive, you know, these uh, live pro uh, camera mixers and you know uh, things to switch videos up and the, the all the software and the computer that goes with those specific things, you know. So setting up the whole software is is another thing, right? Um, yeah, sure. and you know, yeah. it, it keeps growing and growing, and and we're almost we're almost ready to watch it or to launch it, and uh, it's gonna be fun, man. We're just gonna, you know, we're having fun with it at work. Uh, we're branding. Um, we're bringing people on there. We're allowing them to tell their stories, um, of their business startups, and you know wherever it takes us, it takes us. Right? We don't take ourselves that serious. They're going to be live productions. If somebody says some shit on there that they weren't supposed to say, well, oh well, right? We've all right. embarrassed right. ourselves um, right. majorly before. So yeah. who the hell cares anymore? Um, so we're just having fun with it, man. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, well, man, your studio looks phenomenal so far. I can't wait to see it. Uh, uh done and up and running i bet that's oh, like, heck yeah that's gonna be nice yeah i'm um, sure there'll be some bloopers on there and some technical difficulties <laughs> but, hey, you know. man. hey man that's what that's what we got the roadcaster for right where's the oh i love that roadcaster man i love it it's so easy go. to use too yes it's it probably is. the easiest piece of equipment because i've worked in sound studios and sound boots i used to you know work the sound room for the churches and you know, there was big, huge mixing boards in there that had mechanical switches on them and, you know, how to control mm -hmm. the lighting and put together programs for the lights and the sconces, the microphones, mm -hmm. cameras, um, everything back there. So this thing is a breeze compared to that. 
Oh, dude, it is it is awesome. And um, like the funny thing is, is I like dabbled around in like music production like 15 years ago. Um, so I've had an MPC pad. I've had even like even um, like had like the ones that you had to like road road load a um, like floppy drive in to get your oh, pads. And so I had some experience. And whenever I hooked this up the first time, I was like, man. This is legit plug and play. Oh, I was heck like, yeah. You can, you can just straight drag something into a my garage band, rip it down, and put it right on one of these pads in like 30 seconds. And yeah. that that literally used to take me like five minutes per oh, pad yeah. back back 15 years ago. So yeah. I was I was I was really amazed whenever I first hooked it up and I was just like, oh man, this is just straight plug and play. Dude, I love it. You plug your cell phone right into it, have a conversation over the phone. You know, I I was going to bring this studio and use some of the stuff over there, but I said, you know what? I use this so much. You know, I'm just going to buy all new stuff, right? Um, right. And, and can just keep it set up because honestly, like, if I got a lot of phone calls to make, you know, um, I'll work on my computer and I'll have my earphones and my microphone and so I could talk to people at the same time and and have good quality noise and, and you know, it's a oh. soundproof room and you know, so there I can go. get a lot of work done down here if I need to get a lot of work, right? Right, Absolutely. right. I can imagine and, a hyper-focused, that quiet room, just boom. Yeah, out. just go to town, punch so out this and get it done. I don't know how much video stuff you guys do for advertising, but I just downloaded, um, what is that? What is that road app I, I downloaded? Uh, the road capture app. And it is an awesome video capture app. Like it lets you do the dual screen recording at the same uh -huh. time. That way they're like looking at me and they're also looking at what I'm looking at as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So check that out as well because it just plugs right up to your roadcaster as well. So like you can just yeah. transfer stuff back and forth. Um, it was uh, really cool when I found that. And I made three videos on that uh, yeah, like app today. To yeah. Actually. Uh, really cool stuff but yeah. um so you got anything else oh yeah i mean so i'm, I'm just overall curious mr dave i know we've talked a lot about what you've done uh where you've been your stories you know what i mean you're you're up you're everything you came from what you built you know what and everybody has these big ass goals i know i've got big ass goals you know what i mean you have, to, you have the ones that you have to you know what it seems like all what would be everybody else's big ass goal mr david gatto has done wrote the book on it. You know what I mean? Follow me. What, what, what is, what is, what do you look, what are you striving for? What do you want? What is your big ass goal? You know, um, I thought about that, you know, um, and you know, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur through and through, right. Yes, um, you know, cause honestly, man, I could stop what I'm doing, uh, right now and sell everything and live for a very long time. And, and at the level of living that I am now, um, but there's just some part of me that, um, it doesn't stop. Right. It just wants right. to grow and grow and grow. Right. And it's it's not about the money. Right. The, the money it was never about the money for me. Um, money was a byproduct of of the freedom, you know, uh, of giving a good service. Right. Um, my goal, you know, uh, is to just. I'll put it to you like this. Right. Because of that decision that I made to start my business, my kids and their families will be forever changed, right? Um, they'll have an opportunity like we never had, right? To, you know, go into a multi-million dollar uh, operation if they so choose, decide to do that, right? Um, and, and keep that going, right? So um, my goal is just to, to build something that I, I can leave behind, right? That's, uh, uh, you know, um, because the Gatto name wasn't a good name before but now it is right and and to right. um build something that people are proud of uh you know and 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 that's just my goal you know uh to have freedom with my family and in, in which i have right and so like whenever i'm doing something whenever i'm taking something on i always ask myself this this one question i say how much of my time is this going to take right um, is there a way that I can do this, that I could delegate this out, that this operation can run automated without my presence, right? Because then it's an asset, right? An asset is something that makes you money while you're not present, 
right? Mm-hmm. And you could do something else. So, you know, I always ask myself that when I'm getting into a new endeavor, how much of my time is this going to take? And can I build it out so I don't have to be there? Right? Those are important questions to me. But honestly, my goal is to just, it's, I guess you call it a legacy, right? Um, building something from nothing and, and having something to pass down to my kids and their kids. And, you know, um, I bought a Clark forklift uh, last year. And I remember coming out and looking at that Clark forklift and seeing on the side of that, emblazoned on the side of that, it said 50 years in business. It might have been more than that. Um, mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, I said, holy crap. Like, this is a legacy mm-hmm. right here. Okay. This is something that's going to be around for a very long time. After these people are gone, um, who started it? I mean, I mean that's, that's, that's my goal, man, is to, is to just build a legacy for my family that's and amazing. their families. And, you know, because it's, it's really not about the money. Money never made me happy. Right. I mean, it doesn't right. shopping doesn't make me happy. The cars don't make me happy. You know, it's the relationships that I have with people, the relationships that I have with my family, the relationships, the things that we're doing with our money. Right. right? At, right. Through our business, right? The donating, the toys for tots, the helping people, giving them careers. It's just shit like that, man. That's awesome. That's awesome, man. I love it. I, I love it. Yeah, you said you want to be, people just be proud of you, man. I know. I'm proud to be your friend. I consider you a friend. I mean, there's that much you and I'm talking about. Well, I'm proud of you. I know Mr. Billy is and so many other fence professionals around the country are as well, too, man. So your legacy is definitely one in the making. And uh man, I'm excited to just be able to some of this, be on your sidelines watching and cheering you on for that thing that you guys got with what you got going on between uh your business, between the let go to grow, the speaking. Like, man, I'm I'm here for it, man. I like it. Yeah, man, wherever it goes, it goes. You know, I'm just going with the flow. Heck yeah. All right. Well, well, Mr. David, do you have any questions for us? Yeah, man. You got anything for us? Um, you know what? I, I know you guys pretty well. Um, so, uh, I really don't have any questions. Um, I know where you guys are at and, and what you're doing. Um, you know, I, I really like the fact, uh, you know, with Corey with, I was able to have those conversations with him, right. And changing his mindset, you know, when, when he hurt his leg, Right. And, you know, being able to show them that this is an opportunity uh, to grow and this isn't something that's going to stop you. Right. This is an opportunity to show you something. Right. And so, you know, I, I know you guys on a personal level and, um, you know, I really don't have any questions. Um, you know, uh, I think you guys answered them all. Heck yeah, man. That's a that's a that's a good thing to hear. Well, guys, if you do want to follow David, here is his company's website. If you want to order something and you guys service what four or five states, is it now? Oh man, we're all over the place. Maryland, Washington, you know, uh, Delaware, Virginia. Um, we ship tractor trailer loads across the United States. Uh 53 foot tractor trailers anywhere, get them to you in three days. Um, you know, okay, uh, so we do a lot of that. Um Okay. Yeah. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. So we're mainly talking about the DMV area though, right? Yeah. And so like, yeah. So what we do um, with that service right there, that's good. Cause you know, we'll typically bring out a, um, a Moffat truck for that. And so we sell a lot of job lots to those States, right? Because you know, right. contractors can't be affording to come and sitting in line at a place, picking stuff up, then having to go to Lowe's, get concrete and they get over to job site. It's 12 o'clock. They don't really get nothing done. You know, so we're able to provide that service where we say, hey, give us an address and we supply everything, you know, the concrete, the fence, bring it there, you know, so we could show up when they're there and then stage it with a Moffitt all over the yard for them. Um, and, you know, awesome. and and it's that's our model for job lotting. And then the wholesale side, you know, we ship track trailers across the United States, you know, homeland, barat, uh, stuff like that. All right. Well, guys, if you're interested, there is the website to go check out. Um, if you're interested in some consulting, here is the website to check out. Um, I'm interested. I need to get a copy of your book, Mr. Gatto. I haven't oh, read a book in years and years and years, and I'm going to read yours. There's I'm good stuff in lie. that book. And also, too, on that website, um, we have a, 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 an actual um, virtual MBA, so a master's in business administrations, 52-week course in there with testing, a podcast, tutorials, screen recordings, all the good stuff that you can get in there. I mean, it's like going to college and getting all the fat cut out, you know, because they sell you all that crap in college. You got to take English 101 and English 102. You know, you got to take stuff that's irrelevant um, to business. Uh, so there's that on there too. You can guys check it out. 
Oh man, that's awesome, dude. That's like a total. That's a total. Dude, I spent a lot of time building that site out, and you know, I just uh, it was all fully together when I. One minute I was coaching, the next thing I had a full coaching service with class, websites, um, everything. CRMs, drip sales, drip campaigns, nurturing campaigns. I didn't put it out till it was ready. Oh, man. Oh, that man. Well, awesome. I'm excited to uh, pick your brain on some private messages about that um, here in the coming, uh, like coming future. Yeah, Other sure. than that, man, I don't have anything else. Corey, you got anything else? Man, just um, we, you, you and I need to schedule another Zoom meeting here soon. I, 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 we haven't talked in a couple of weeks, and uh, yeah. decided to tell you what all we've done, what all we've messed up, what all we figured out, what all we fixed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's been, I tell you, you know, starting off at the beginning of the year, it was a broken. It was like restarting the business from scratch all over again. Mm, that's and, absolutely what it was. And it was, it's, it's, it's. We're only eight weeks in, nine weeks into it now. I'm eight weeks post off, nine weeks post um, um, eight. And eight weeks post off. And it's what you and I have managed to achieve in just that eight weeks. And the fact that shit, we're still in business. We're still here. You and know, we're still we, getting paychecks. And, and we didn't, we didn't, <laughs> it's been tight, but it's been, yeah. hey. you know, it's been right. the fact that we're, you know, we were down and out for eight weeks, yeah. you know, and you know, I didn't quite as I come off a hard winter or going into a hard winter off a rough year, man, I tell you what, everything you've said is, has been as, I'm bare to witness of what Mr. David has been preaching, what's in his books, uh, the rules, the orders, the pr process, the procedures, like you're not going to get it off. Whoever, you know, this is, this is actually a little PSA for everybody who's wanting to uh, reach out to Mr. David or read his books and all that for somebody who has done it it's, and has spoken to him. These things work if you're willing to work it. Oh, absolutely. And I was propped up with a, my leg up <laughs> for however many weeks. And it was, that's all I had time to do was sit yeah. there and try to figure this stuff out and, and don't get discouraged if it doesn't work the first time. Get discouraged. Yeah. No, you know, yeah. I say I'm the, that's the, the opposite is that I am my own worst critic. I will talk right. shit to myself so bad. Yeah. And it's just a matter of that's how I push myself to be, to be better. So yeah. if I mess right. up, I'm like, Dumb ass. you know, oh man, we're just, just <laughs> we're just. We're just jotting down notes of things we need to change every job. Yeah, man. This is the funnest oh, part of the whole journey, man. It, where, you, where you guys are at, this is the funnest part. It's, you know, uh, this I, is the when you got your back up against the wall, you are forced <laughs> to get creative. You are forced to think outside the box. That's where all the growing happens. Say, all right, I got enough for my rent. I got enough for my groceries. Yeah. I got enough for, for payroll. I got enough for my next material order. Oh, I don't I got it. How am I going to get it? Right. And it forces you out of the box. This was the funnest part of my company. That just building it, and holding on to my seat of my yeah. pants. Yeah, Let me rephrase that. That's where we've been back to. Yeah. Because we've all to. been through that in the beginning. And now we're in our fifth year. And it's so funny how you said that five years, you did a million. I mean, at five years, at, uh, at the five year mark, five we, year mark. Did, we did 1.2 this past year. Yeah. And the brokest we've ever been. I'm like, that is so yep. true how that happened. <laughs> and then <laughs> we spit it with the injury where I, where I snapped my leg. And it's like, shit, we're really starting from scratch all over. Started again. from scratch. Yeah. But, but you know are. what? It's a, it's a, it's a good start from scratch and I'm looking forward to it, man. I am, I am so excited for what 2024 has to come. We pulled over on the um, side of the road two weeks ago and just went fishing in the middle of the day. It's like, oh, yeah. we have what an hour and a half before our next estimate, you know, what, let's pull over and do some fishing. Hold yeah. On. Yeah, we did. It was a great have time. Fun. Have fun. It was a great time, man. It was a great time. Well, I know we gotta go. I'm sorry, Mr. David. I very much appreciate you for coming on the show yes, and um, like talking to us uh, for a nice hour. Um, again, I'm gonna drop. Uh, it's going to be let go to grow and then futuresolutionsfence.com, guys. If you want to check Mr. David out, go to these two links. And other than that, guys, we will see you later, Mr. David. Thank you again for coming on. Thanks again, guys, Thanks, for having me. It's been wonderful. Have a great night, guys. All right, buddy. You too. Yep. See you. Oh, man. That was a good interview, dude. dude he's, so, he's so much fun to talk to. That was our, a good one. Our, uh, I've, I don't know, four or five Zoom meetings were last, you know, last year and a half with Mr. David. And mm -hmm. this is a plethora of knowledge on every single one. And uh, I figured out how this thing sounds best. Like, they condenser mic so you're gonna have to talk straight into it condenser mic yep there we go all right you got it but uh he his, his zoom meetings are just like that when we have our, our facetime calls he's uh they, they always last a little bit longer because you just 
there's always more that you want to say. Right. That conversation can go on and on and on. And it's, it is never a dull moment. It's always good stuff. It's always good parables, good analogies, good, you know, everything that you need. And what's so funny is where he is so good at public speaking and public talking is that he has the ability is borderline like at church. We're like, damn, this dude's talking right to me. Like, <laughs> you ever had that when you were a kid at church? Right. You're like, this dude's in my head. Yep. You know, it's, it's yep. like that same thing because it, it shows you where you already know where the magic happens. Because it's just like you said, it's, it's the magic happens in the work that you're trying to avoid. Right. And it's, it's proof in the pudding right there, man. That's it. Got a lot of comments. on. We that. got a, we got a lot of comments to get to, I don't think we're going to get to all of them, but um, yeah. everybody, thank you for commenting. Uh, James Scott Phillips. I saw you uh, hey. with some, uh, with some popcorn. What's going on, buddy? Um, uh, Mr. Robert Evers, what is going on, buddy? Hello. Noah Divine Mr. was Noah. in here. Mr. Steele. Was Chris in there? You like the uh, you like the sign, buddy? What's up, Chris? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, we had a we had a lot of comments tonight. If I didn't get to you, I th I'm pretty sure I posted just about every single one, but we didn't talk to him. There's Dan hanging and banging, brother. Hanging and banging, brother. Uh, we got uh, we got Josh Rand. Uh, there we go. What's going on, Mr. Josh Rand? You know, I've, How never is Utah? Josh. I've never talked to him. I've seen him all the time in the fence world and on the page and all that. I don't think him I have ever had a conversation. Oh, hmm. all I right. Well, I'm on one of these days. Guess I might have to do that. All right. We got Mr. Noah Divine. David's story is very inspiring. Absolutely is. And no matter how many times i hear it it's it's uh it's like the first time hearing it all over again and it's uh it's uh it's a great story every single time i hear it is that mr sean saying what's up good show good uh ho good uh, -ho. uh what's going on mr king how was your training day today i saw you uh out there today good show thank you sir thank you sir all right all right all right, guys. So if you do want to follow us, which would be awesome for anybody to do, it is completely free for a uh, like, uh, follow, subscribe, hit that um, like ring notification bell. If you're on YouTube, uh, you can go to gatekeeperpodcast.com and you can find all of our links or any way to listen to us. If the audio format is your go to or on Apple podcast, Amazon, Spotify, basically anything that has audio podcasts we're on, uh, as far as video wise, we're on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, there's a merchandise store there as well. I oh, mean, I keep going the wrong way, <laughs> uh, but just give us a like, a click, a follow. Everything helps. And, um, Corey, you got anything else? Man, just thank you for letting me be part of this. I know I got some big shoes to, set, uh, to fill in, you know, with Dan being out and uh, you know, you're stepping out. And I am, I'm, I'm, I got some big shoes to fill. And I'm just happy to be here, man. Thank you so much. Really All right, it. guys. Well, hey, we are going to mix it up since we got a nice. Prof Go ahead, bro. Since we got a nice professional intro. No, 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 no. Hit that top one. Boom. Thank you.